We are in your home. Uh, we're having a conversation with history with Chief Emeka Ayoko. I mean, I've been dreaming to meet him. And here we are. God has made it happen. Nature has made it happen. And uh, I, I mentioned to you earlier that I want to have a handshake with you and laminate <laughs> it for posterity. <laughs> it's so good to be here. Thank you for, for welcoming us into your home, your natural environment. And I'm sure this ride is going to be a jolly good ride. Right? Well, it's a pleasure talking with you, <laughs> meeting you. I mean, there's so many young people who don't really know who you are. So this, uh, this platform, this program will give them that opportunity to know you up close and personal. Do we have a deal? Oh, well, that's, that's <laughs> fine. Yes. I also know you as one who is, who is very blunt. You say it as it is. You're very straight jacketed and you write your story on plain paper in plain sight. So are we going to have that on Conversation with History today? Oh, yes, yes, I will. <laughs> Tell no, it as it is. Tell it as it is. No holds <laughs> back. Good. So like we always do on the program, um, we start off with your background. I mean, there's not, you know, it, it would be better off hearing it from the horse's mouth. That's hearing it from you. I was born at Ienu Mission Hospital with, you know, Giddy. My father who was a strict diarist, entered in his diary that I was born at 2.30 a.m. on 18th January 1933, which makes me 89, about to be, I'll be 90 in my next birthday in I January. And um, I went to primary schools, including in a place called Abo. Delta State. Uh, Delta State. And from there, I went to Oba. An educationist, a very prominent Igbo educationist, Oxford trained, Mr. Enoch Oli, who was a very great friend of my father, came and saw my father and said that he was going to start a school, a private school, to be modeled along uh, English public schools. And my father said, well, Enoch, my first son, I'll give him to you to educate. So I went to Merchants of Light School, Oba. I didn't sit for common entrance to Umwaiha or DMGS, uh, which my brother did after me and went to Moaya, but I went to Merchants of Light School. And after Merchants of Light School, I taught for 18 months between leaving school and taking the entrance examination to University College of Ibadan. I taught at Emmanuel College, Oweri. And then I went to Ibadan University College, as it then was, being a University College of London University at the time. And I read classics. And after five years of uh, classical education, I was recruited by what was then the Commonwealth Development Corporation and sent to England, uh, to various institutions in the UK, to, to be trained in financial services. And then after that, I worked briefly at the headquarters of CDC in London and was posted back to Nigeria. I was executive assistant to the regional controller. And then in February 1962, the chairman of CDC, Lord Howick, was on official visit to Nigeria and had a meeting with the Prime Minister Abubakar Tafawa Balawa, and he was accompanied to the meeting by Sir Peter Minazagan, who was the regional controller, and myself, the executive assistant. And at the meeting, the Prime Minister asked a number of questions about CDC supported projects in West Africa. And the chairman said, Anyoko, you dealing with these, answer the Prime Minister. So I 
answered the Prime Minister most of the questions he asked. At the end of the meeting, as we were leaving, the Prime Minister called me back and said, look, young man, we are still relying on the British for experts and consultants. The Permanent Secretary Minister of Finance who was at that meeting was an Englishman, Clark. And the Prime Minister said, and you're working for a British institution, I'd like you to come and work for your national government. And I think you will be a good material in the diplomatic service. Just like that? Just like that. And to cut a long story short, um, two days later, the orderly of the Minister of State in Foreign Affairs, Nuhu Bamale, came to see me in my office, at CDC office in a custom street, uh, brought me the civil service application, said it was instruction from Prime Minister's office that I should complete this. So I completed that and I was interviewed and uh, I joined the foreign ministry. And after this was in, I joined the foreign ministry in April 62. And then a year later, I was, I was uh, three weeks after joining the foreign service, the permanent secretary who was present at the interview, civil service commission interview, appointed me his personal assistant. I was his personal assistant for a year and then was posted to New York to Nigeria's permanent mission to the United Nations. And I was there for three years on the Ambassador Chief, Simeon Adebo. And when the new Commonwealth Secretariat was established, the first Secretary General came to Nigeria to see Prime Minister Tafawa Balewa and said he wanted a Nigerian to join the team that he was building up a uh, team of diplomats at the Commonwealth Secretariat and he wanted uh, a bright Nigerian. And uh, as a result of that, I was recalled from New York and posted to London to the Commonwealth Secretariat in 1966. First as assistant director, then in 71 I was promoted by the Secretary General, uh, the director. Uh, 1975, I became Assistant Secretary General, and uh, two years later, in 1977, I was appointed Deputy Secretary General, I remain, which was uh, the office I held until 1983, when uh, President Shagari invited me to come and be Foreign Minister of Nigeria. I did that for three months, when the soldiers kicked us out of government. and. Fortunately, I was able to return to the job that I left um, in the Secretariat. And some years later, four years later, or five years later, in, uh, at their meeting in Kuala Lumpur, Commonwealth Heads of Government elected me their Secretary General. So that's the story. What followed? Well, I was Secretary General from 1990 to 2000. And um, as Secretary General, I, I had uh, uh, three main objectives. One was to promote democracy and good governance in Commonwealth countries. Uh, the second was to increase the level of practical cooperation among the Commonwealth countries. And um, the third one was to deal with the economic development in Commonwealth countries. As far as the first objective was concerned, I was responsible throughout my period for the transformation of some Commonwealth countries that had been one-party states I held s several conversations with their presidents and was responsible for persuading them to adopt multi-party democratic form of government. Um, I had long conversations with President Kenneth Kaunda of Zambia, for example, who was a one-party state, and he then changed to multi-party. 
I had similar conversations with uh, President Moore in Kenya. I had similar conversations with President Banda in Malawi. And I had similar conversations with President uh, Rone in the Seychelles, Republic of Seychelles. So I was, I made it my mission. And of course, in South Africa, I played a seminal role in the transition of South Africa from apartheid to uh, non-racial democracy. You, you, you know, just listening to you talk, yes. I mean, everything you have said is so idealistic. And uh, I wonder how you feel now knowing what you know now and what you're seeing around you. I mean, it's not just, not just in Nigeria, but the world in general. I mean, you, one could tell that you, you had that passion, you had that enthusiasm to make a change, you know, in, in your life, and, which you have done. Your vision, you know, back then, have, has it manifested, has, is it reflecting in a current reality? Well, I would say to an extent I'm pleased that uh, most of these countries in which I was involved in the transition from one party state to two multi party states have remained multi party uh, governed countries. Um, but that's as far as democracy and the institutions of democracy are concerned. But as far as governance, good governance is concerned, I have some regrets and some reservations because not all the countries uh, have uh, sustained good governance. Uh, Nigeria, at the time I was uh, uh, maturing, was different from what it is now. If anything, uh, in the years immediately after our independence, we were full of hopes. I was full of hopes and aspirations for my country. We were then progressing. I mean, uh, in the years immediately after independence, we had the groundnut pyramids in northern Nigeria. We had very thriving heights and skin, leather industry in northern Nigeria. We had booming cocoa uh, products in western Nigeria. We had palm produce booming in eastern Nigeria. And we had rubber plantations booming in what became mid, uh, Midwest of Nigeria. So Nigeria's economic development was moving fast apace. The story now is different. Where did we get it wrong? I think mainly because our governance has uh, uh, taken the wrong turn. Things were moving better when we had a federation of four regions, and the regions were competing healthily among themselves. The regions were largely autonomous, so they could take care of their development, they could take care of their education, their health services, their security, and so on. But since the military came into governance in Nigeria in 66, we moved away from a true federation that we had to an effective unitary system of government where the center dictates to the rest of the country. And that has had the effect of slowing down our pace of development. That has had the effect of weakening the security structures in the country because um, the security could not be maintained in all parts of the country from Abuja. Um, and that has changed the character of uh, our citizens in terms of the ethical values. Um, in those days, success was known to be the result of hard work and integrity. Now, success is measured in, in monetary terms. People 
Young people believe they can make money without working hard for it. And elderly ones also make money without working hard for it. We have a massive embezzlement of uh, uh, national resources. These are things not happening when we had effective and true federation. And so I'm afraid that I take the view, the view that uh, unless and until we return to effective federal, federal system, we are not likely to make much progress in realizing our deserved uh, aspirations. Uh, so the story now for young people, I mean, it was unheard of in my student days, examination malpractice, unheard of. Now it's a commonplace thing. Forgery of certificates was unheard of in my school days. Now it's a common uh, phenomenon. And so these are the changes that I believe have uh, uh, come about because of the change in our governance structure. Nigeria, once upon a time, we had our culture. There was an infiltration of westernization. Would you say the infiltration of that westernization has also obliterated our own culture? Because we had something going for us. And in that yes. culture that we had, there were ethics, you know, guiding our practices on yes. a daily basis. Yes. So where did we get it wrong in terms of, you know, what we have now, where, you know, most people or some people are so morally bankrupt and you wonder why you're on the same space and time with these people? Well, I think the change began to happen when the resources, we had easy money from crude oil, hmm. Um, the uh, easy, what I call easy money from crude oil in, in uh, great proportion. We were selling crude oil and not people began to abandon agriculture, move to the cities because of the construction and so on. And the sense of hard work began to dissipate. And also, because of uh, the easy money, people, the culture of respect and ethics began to give way to the culture of making money. At so all cost. money began to matter more than anything else. So you moved away from the culture where people's means and lifestyle uh, was determined by their legitimate means of uh, getting their money began to change. People no longer cared about how others made the money. They would steal, they would cheat, uh, what mattered was that they had the money. They would go to their homes, give money to churches or mosques. Is it peculiar to Nigeria? Mm -hmm. Would you say it's peculiar to Nigeria? No, it's not peculiar to Nigeria, mm -hmm. but Nigeria has taken it to a much greater degree than most other countries. No, no, no. Em embezzlement of public funds happens in many, many countries. We have the minuses you have mentioned that. Now, let's look at the pluses. Mm -hmm. um, from that time to now, what would you say, okay, has impressed you, you know, that Nigeria so far? Well, we have had pluses, no doubt. Um, the development of the country in terms of uh, infrastructure, although at the moment uh, the infrastructure may not be satisfactory, but it infrastructure has improved in this country. Um, the, you look at the physical appearance of our cities, you see skyscrapers and so on. I mean, in the early days, I remember when the Cocoa House was built in Ibadan by Premier 
of Bafemia Wallower. That was unique. It was the tallest building around. And, uh, but now you see skyscrapers in Lagos, in Ribado, in Port Harcourt, in Kano, in Kaduna. You see skyscrapers all over the place. Um, and then, of course, look at the telecommunications. Um, we have had major uh, revolution in telecommunications. The mobile system, which people now take for granted, didn't exist in early days. And it was, it took, uh, uh, I think it was President Obasanjo's time that revolutionized uh, um, uh, telecommunications in this country. And then look at the banking sector. We are doing very well in the banking sector. Uh, in my time, there were probably no more than four or five banks. Now you have a, a, a multiplicity of banks in the country. These are pluses, and we've had, uh, uh, in terms of uh, external appointments, I mean, uh, I was uh, the highest Nigerian pop, uh, international office holder in my time, but now we have Ngozi Okonjo Iwala as the Director General of WTO. You have uh, Akumi Adeshina as uh, uh, President of African Development Bank, and you have uh, Benedict Orama as the president of Afro-Exim Bank. So Nigeria's uh, presence abroad uh, has shown a remarkable degree of success. And, and, and uh, uh, we should celebrate that, but also we should care about our internal situation. Because at the end of the day, uh, countries standing abroad is largely determined by the situation in the country. And as long as we have these minuses in our country, we are not likely to gain the degree of respect and recognition internationally that we deserve. You know, once upon a time, um when you hear Nigeria is so the giant of Africa, yes, you know, and a lot of things are really working in our, in our favor. And today, when you ask some people, they will say Nigeria is really living, you know, experiencing an existential crisis. Others will say, well, it's just one of those things. It's just yeah. one of those phases. It will come and go. What would be your own response to that? Uh, to the question of the state of Nigeria. In the earlier days, in the years after independence, Nigeria's standing internationally was high and deserved the description of giant of Africa. Nigeria produced the first African commander of a UN force, peacekeeping force. Uh, Brigadier Ironsi was appointed by UN Secretary General as the commander of the UN forces in the Congo. In New York, in 1964, when the United Nations faced an existential crisis as a dispute between the West and the Soviet Union and the East, the three ambassadors who rescued the UN were the Nigerian ambassador, the Indian ambassador, and the Japanese ambassador. So high was our standing internationally that Chief Adebo, our ambassador, was asked to mediate. And he, with his Indian and Japanese colleagues, mediated and saved the United Nations because the General Assembly was going to be paralyzed by the dispute between the East and the West, which would have meant the end of the General Assembly. Hmm. Nigeria's standing was such. And during those years, 
Nigeria's passport was respected. Now, of course, uh, the green passport is not, uh, does not enjoy the same level of respect as it did in the past. So I would want to see us return to the standing that we had in the past by changing our situations at home. What would be your blueprint if you were you know, to make re recommendations you know, yes. as to how to change it such that we'll go back and restore our pride of place? My first recommendation would be that we change our governance structure. Because the governance structure we had in the past, when we were a true federation of four regions, four federating units that were individually viable, as against what we now have, 36 federating units, most of which are not viable units in economic terms. We have to start by changing the governance structure. Some call it restructuring, some others call it modi modifying the governance structure. Okay, so still talking about government and governance, you yes. have always harped on uh, the cost of governance. Yes. Has that opinion, has that perception changed? And if it hasn't, <laughs> no. How, do we, how on, do we resolve that? How do we address it? On the contrary, my view that our present governance structure is most expensive, coupled with the attitudes of those who practice, the, uh, who operate the structures. For example, um, our parliamentarians in this country are uniquely highly paid. A senator in Nigeria earns almost double or three times what a senator in the United States earns. And the cost of running our government here with the structure of 36 federating units and each unit, each state, has a full paraphernalia of civil service, judiciary, state assemblies. Can you imagine if you reduced the federating units to six, you will save a great deal of money. And you will, there are other aspects of the structure that I would propose that would add uh, to the amount of money you are able to save because um, it's debatable whether uh, parliamentarians should uh, be full-time. My suggestion would be that uh, uh, parliamentarians should not be full-time. My suggestion would be that uh, instead of two houses at the center, you have a unicameral, have one parliament at the instead center. Instead of the bicameral that we have. Not instead of the bicameral that we have. And in this federating units, you have unicameral. In that way, you save a great deal of resources in terms of the cost of governance. Now, let's look at the republics. We've had first, second, third, and fourth republic. And one would think, okay, that should reflect progression. Would you agree with that? Uh, no, no, on the contrary, I, I would say that the first republic was so far the most successful republic we've had. Because in the First Republic, the country was at peace with itself. National unity meant something. Nigerians were proud of their pass passports and uh, traveled around the world and were respected in every country. That was during the First Republic. 
Okay, so you are from the eastern part of the country. Mm -hmm. And for some people, I mean, some observers and even actors believe that, uh, you know, Nigeria has not been fair to the eastern uh, Nigerians. What would be your own take? I mean, this is your perception now of many, many, you know, speculations, accusations, and, you know, statements that have been put out there. What would be your stand, you know, in this, in this regard? Well, as I said, I believe in one Nigeria. I grew up as a Nigerian, and it might interest you to know that my wife is a Yoruba from Abelkuta, and we, next month, will be married. We'll be married for 60 years. And so, for me, Nigeria is a reality. But at the same time, I insist that that reality must be sustained on the basis of a structure of governance that gives every part of the country a sense of belonging to it. So you are all for restructuring? Well, I'm all for changing the present governance structure, yes. With the 1999 constitution, which of course is effective and which of course we uh, defer to, do you think that is possible with this recommendation you just gave? No, no, no. No, no, it's not possible. The 1999 constitution is built on 36 federating units. And that's never going to work. Apart from the fact that the 1999 constitution cannot really be said to be the product of the Nigerian population because in most countries, constitutions are made by representatives of the people who can then truthfully say, we the people of this country have decided to have this constitution. I don't think that can be truthfully said of the 1999 constitution. There is also this accusation, and, and this is going to mm. our colonial masters, that if probably if they didn't interfere in our business, we probably would have progressed, you know, far more than we have now, that we were set from the very beginning for failure. Would you agree with that? Up to a point, I do <clears throat> think that um, the way we changed our structure of governance by moving away from true federation to uh, quasi-federation uh, in terms of effective, effectively we have a unitary system of government. That for a diverse country like Nigeria set us up for failure. Hmm. That was a bombshell. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Because if we had, I believe that if the soldiers had not come into governance in January 1966, the four regions of Nigeria would have made greater progress in terms of their development and Nigeria would have achieved greater unity as a united political entity. We would not have had the agitations that we now have, some of them secessionist in nature, whether it's uh, Biafra or Dudua or Ijo, or, you know, or Middle Belt, uh, uh, movements, agitations, we wouldn't have had that if we had not changed the structure of our governance. Now, this is military. You were talking about a military incursion into yes. governance. You know, that itself has had its impact. What about the colonial masters? I would acknowledge that uh, the British 
<coughs> government when they amalgamated Northern and Southern protectorates to create Nigeria uh, didn't have the uh, interests of the indigenous Nigerians at heart. But I believe that the result of the amalgamation can be made to serve the interests of Nigeria. So let's look at this British imperialism. Do you think the British imperialism has also affected us such that uh, we may never recover from it? No, no, we will recover. Of course we will recover. We will recover, uh, but the recovery lies in our hands. They may not have laid the best foundations for us, but having left in 1960, it is for us. We hold our fortunes in our hands. You know, why I ask you these questions is because yes. of your position as uh, the Secretary General of the Commonwealth. I mean, yes. you've had very good relationship, personal and formal relationship with the British government. There is also this argument that the English left through the front door, but yes. they still control us through the back door. And, you know, it's now a function <laughs> of, yes, Colonialism was thrown out, but new colonialism has replaced the colonial uh, rule that it had. What would be your reaction to that my statement? Re my reaction is that I do not accept that as a valid uh, excuse for our poor performance. The British um, probably left marks on our mentality, but also the same marks we are left on the mentality of Indians and Malaysians. And they have overcome all that. They've, I mean, India has, involved, has evolved into an Indian state, Indian nation. Malaysia has evolved into a Malaysian nation notwithstanding the diversity inherent in them. But we have not yet evolved as a Nigerian nation. Nigeria still remains a country, but has not become a nation. And there's a difference between a country and a nation. A country is more of a geographic uh, uh, identity. A nation is more of people's identity. A nation, people are proud of their nation. They are prepared to die for their nation. Okay, so we roll back to your time uh, during your um, tenure or your time as the Secretary General of the Commonwealth. I mean, that was a very big, big achievement. During your time, what would you say were your landmark achievements in terms of, I mean, the big wins for Nigeria as a nation and you as a person, as an individual? Well, I would say that uh, during my tenure as Secretary General, um, I helped to establish democratic forms of government in a number of member states. Um, as I mentioned, uh, I named Zambia, Kenya, Malawi, Seychelles. I also succeeded in intervening in domestic crises in a number of Commonwealth countries. Coming nearer home to Nigeria, when Nigeria decided uh, to have elections after uh, General Abdul Salami Abubakar became president, a uh, head of state, not president. He talked with me. The then head of uh, Nigeria's INEC, I'm not sure it was called INEC then, but uh, the Electoral Commission, uh, Justice Ephraim Abata came to London to my office. We had discussions, and I sent 
team of electoral experts to Nigeria to help organize the election that uh, brought President Obasanjo to power. And then, of course, when um, the election were annulled in 1992 uh, or 93, I spoke out. I, criticize the annulment of the elections. And uh, when Abacha um, imprisoned Obasanjo, I intervened not only myself passionately, but I got President Mandela and others to intervene with Abacha. I got President Museveni of Uganda and the President Mugabe of Zimbabwe to come to see Abacha to plead for Obasanjo's release. Um, I remember my last telephone conversation with General Abacha when I was trying to persuade him um, to bring out Obasanjo from the prison. And he said to me that uh, the charges of treason was a serious thing and, and so on. And uh, he said to me, Excellency, you know, I love this, my country, Nigeria, and uh, do anything to defend it. And I said to him, Excellency, I'm sure you know that I'm older than you are, so I have loved the country longer than you have. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but anyway, I didn't get far. Um, and, and then, of course, uh, after my retirement, I have uh, uh, done two, made two contributions. Once, first, for 14 years, I was the chairman of Presidential Advisory Council on Foreign Affairs. Uh, uh, President Obasanjo set up a council to advise him and his government on foreign affairs, and I was chairman of that of, throughout Obasanjo's time, throughout Yaradoa's time, and throughout Jonathan's time. Yeah, and and, and uh, you remember that in 2015, when there was uh, the Peace uh, possibility, a threat of violence marring the elections, I and my good friend Kofi Annan, the former United Nations Secretary General, I asked him to come. I chaired the meeting that adopted what became the Abuja Accord. And after that, this accord was signed by President Jonathan, General Buhari, and 12 other presidential candidates uh, signed it. And after that, I felt there was need for a mechanism to monitor the observance of the terms of the accord by political parties and to help influence them. To, and uh, I asked General Abdul Salami Abubakar, retired head of state, and I said that the mechanism should be serviced not by government but by an independent entity such as Matthew Kuka's center. And I spoke with the center and that was the beginning of the National Peace Committee that has continued to work to the advantage of the country since then. And are you proud of yourself, given what it has achieved so far? Well, uh, what it's achieved so far uh, pleases me, yes, yes, I can, I wouldn't say I'm proud of it, but I'm pleased with its You're achievement. pleased so with far. the outcome yes, of the peace. Yes, uh, yes. Okay, so these are domestic uh, influences and yes. uh, um, achievements or impact, you know, given your experience from the foreign scene. Now, um, the question, the next question will be, how your position as a Secretary General of the Commonwealth then influenced or impacted on modern land as a son of the soil who was representing us at that level? How is uh, it? Maybe quite <laughs> clear with your question. Um, how my position yes. impacted 
Nigeria. Ne I mean, ne you are mm -hmm. a son of the soil yes. who is representing motherland yes. you know, at that level. How impactful was your position to yeah. the Nigerian nation on the global scene? Well, to start with, uh, uh, as a Nigerian, I was acknowledged as a Nigerian abroad in all the countries I went to. And I, my career, I traveled to almost 100 countries. And uh, each time I came, um, the fact that I was a Nigerian was acknowledged. And uh, as a picture there, my one of my visits to China, even Nigerian flag was hoisted. Uh, uh, so that in itself was uh, an international acknowledgement of uh, my Nigerian um, antecedent. And also, um, you know, in respect of South Africa, that uh, then General Obasanjo was a co-chairman of a Commonwealth Eminent Persons Group that first intervened in South Africa, apartheid South Africa, to try and promote dialogue between the apartheid regime and the anti-apartheid movements. Obasanjo was uh, co-chairman of that initiative, and that was mainly because of me. Um, and um, it, it's uh, interesting because at that time um, I came, Nigeria had been designated as one of the six countries at the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting in the Bahamas six countries were designated to produce members of the eminent persons group. During your time was when it was seen the door was shut on Nigeria in terms of, you know, uh, all yeah. that happened that yeah. time. Mm -hmm. um, how did you meander through that storm <laughs> as an individual who is also representing yes, the country yes, yes. and, you know, the impact of all the politics ticking and politicking that was going on that period. Yes. Well, to start with, I, as I told you, my passion in my job was the promotion of democracy, good governance, and human rights. Nigeria was suspended from membership of the Commonwealth because it flouted this basic value of the Commonwealth. And um, when the decision to suspend Nigeria was taken, some heads who knew me felt that I would resign. And so in a very unusual manner, in the communique, uh, announcing the suspension of Nigeria, there was a special paragraph on the Secretary General reaffirming their confidence in the Secretary General. And two of such leaders spoke to me, said, look, 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 Emeka, we know you are likely to want to resign, but we don't want you to resign. This, now your country has flouted our basic principle and uh, if you are true to that principle, you should remain to see it. And that was the only reason why, how I was able to remain in office after the suspension of Nigeria, and how I was therefore glad. Uh, I sent experts to help the elections, and I was glad to announce the return of Nigeria to the Commonwealth the day that uh, President Obasanjo, uh, I announced it at the uh, Thanksgiving service for his inauguration in Abuja. Okay, so tell us about your sojourn during that um, short time of your uh, tenure as, as a minister. Of as foreign, foreign minister. Yes, minister of foreign affairs. The most interesting part was uh, my experience with the Senate because 
as you know, the Senate um, usually has a committee that interviews, screens. Uh, that screens the nominees for ministerial appointments. Yes. And uh, I was nominated by President Shagari as a uh, foreign minister to be. And people, uh, some people came to me to say, you are not lobbying anybody, you are not settling any senator, you should, you know. Um, and I said, no. Um, I remember one of them said to me, Chief, this is Lagos, not London. I said, even in Lagos, things must be done properly. So I refused. Of course, the consequence of that was that in the screening exercise, I was shocked uh, that the screening committee passed the ministers but failed six of us. And I was one of the six that they failed to pass. And then, and then um, before all that, two of my personal friends had come to me to say, look, we know what is happening. You leave us, <clears throat> we will settle these uh, senators. And I said to them individually, if you settle anybody, give a cobra to anybody, I will publicly denounce you for doing that in my name. So they left me to my Device. devices. <laughs> and the screening committee of the Senate dealt me the blow of turning me down, saying I wasn't fit for to be minister. Whereupon I went to uh, President Shagari. Fortunately, the post I left to come to Nigeria for the screening was not to be filled until I took oath of office in Nigeria. So I told the President, I'm returning to London. And President Shagari said, no, Chief, I know what is happening. I'm prepared to nominate you if necessary, 20 times until there, because I want to use you to teach a lesson in the conduct of senators and public. And uh, I remember I jokingly said to him, sir, 20 times, I think two or three times, yes. <laughs> But 20 times, nothing will be left of my <laughs> reputation after that. So, uh, uh, but he then said to me, I should go and see the Senate president, who was then Joseph Wyers. And I went to see um, President Wyers. And Wyers told me that their reason for uh, deeming me unfit for ministerial appointment was because I was detached and was not mixing with them, not seeing uh, them. I was detached. And, uh, you were feeling too superior you know, in another, and, in another and, term. <laughs> <laughs> but that it would change. It would not happen again. And of course, the second time, my uh, hearings lasted no more than five minutes because they all unanimously uh, past me. You know, the interesting thing about uh, this whole, what you have just said, you know, is that it will seem this corruption syndrome runs deep and goes way back. Because, yes. I mean, mm -hmm. if we're talking about you wanting to induce people at that time, yes. you know, for a political <coughs> position, yes. uh, it speaks to why this whole corruption um, has festered and has affected us across board, not just in nationally, but internationally. I think we should start with our political leaders. Um, in March of 1983, that's six months before President Shagari invited me to come and be foreign minister, I had given the 
alumni lecture at the University of Ibadan in which I denounced the corruption, the rate of corruption in Nigeria. In fact, I said at that time, my understanding was that to become a senator, you need to have no less than one million naira. In those days, 1983, I denounced all that. So much so that when President Shakari invited me at my first meeting with him, he said to me, uh, Chief, I gather you, six months ago, you denounced my government and your country. And uh, I said to him, sir, sir, I hope they told you how I introduced my lecture. He said, how did you? I said, I quoted Winston Churchill, who said that he made it a rule when he was outside the United Kingdom not to criticize his government or party, but when he was home, he made up for lost time. <laughs> <laughs> and President Chagari's reaction was exactly like yours. He laughed and said, no, they didn't tell me that. And um, <clears throat> I um, uh, then uh, proceeded uh, uh, after that, of course. Uh, you asked me how I think this corruption should Can be, be tackled, yes, addressed. First, we must ensure that the cost of elections in this country is not what it is at the moment. Hmm. I found it ridiculous that political parties will be charging up to 100 million naira. The limit is not observed the, to the cost that people spend on their elections. I think that should be the beginning of checking corruption. If it is said that elections should not cost more than nomination forms should be, say, um, 100,000 Naira, and uh, election expenses should not exceed a reasonable sum of money, then people who are not going there for money might be encouraged to stand for elections and when they get into the office might be encouraged not to want to embezzle public funds. And also in our public services, um, the examples set by ministers and uh, permanent secretaries will be important. Uh, Public servants should perform their jobs without demanding money. Because in every, at every level, I'm told, going to get a passport and going to get license, people have to bribe. That's the way corruption spreads. And so the values that people have, not of public service, but of means of making money, that's how they view their public service, that has to be checked. So now looking at um, where we stand as a people, um, the young people look at you know, these political offices and they expect that, okay, one day I will aim you know, to become this and become that. But because they don't have the funding for it, you know, that in itself is a form of disenfranchisement. Because what has happened now, I mean, given your analysis, mm -hmm. it would seem that the good people do not even stand a chance mm -hmm. of, you know, aiming for this position because they don't yes. even have the funding. Yes. Yeah. And in getting the funding, you have to at least dip your hand deep into some pockets for you to be able to raise that money you know, to get, you know, into those public offices. Because before I was asking, is it that they stop creating noble people like you in the country? <laughs> is that why we are having people in government, you know, that are not reflective of the virtues and character that you have projected yeah, so far? Yeah. Have God stopped no. creating the likes of you in Nigeria? No, no. You're very kind to so describe me. There are many, many uh, people that I would... Uh, 
uh, say, uh, like me, and, and so on, but they are not interested in public offices because of the things we've been talking about, the cost and so on. Every society has to devise means for conducting its elections and so on. Maybe that at this stage we first need to have a system where political parties should fund their representatives at elections so that the individual doesn't need to be wealthy before he or she is able to stand for election. Maybe after that, over a period, we then get to a point where money ceases to matter. The extent of expenses on elections would become insignificant. Okay. So that said, uh, we are going to leave this very serious one to the very, you know, we'll, we're, go we're going to go up close and personal. In fact, when I hear your diction, I'm challenged as a broadcast, <laughs> <laughs> as a broadcast journalist. <coughs> I'm like, whoa, wow. I mean, if it wasn't what you did, what else would you have done? I mean, in terms of profession, would you have chosen broadcasting as one of your choices? <laughs> Have done that? Some people have occasionally teased me with saying, you know, you talk like a broadcaster. Have you worked in broadcasting before? And I say, no, I've never done, but I have had very good friends who are broadcasters. No, I suppose that if I had not joined uh, the Nigerian diplomatic service, I would have remained in the private sector. Uh, I will remain in the financial sector. services sector. For what is worth, I mean, I'm here having a conversation <laughs> with history with Chief Emeka Ayoko, and I'm seated next to the Queen. I was very particular about that. This is the closest I can get to the Queen, you know, <laughs> via uh, Chief Emeka Ayoko. And it feels so good. How would you describe your relationship with the Queen? Well, let me start by saying that this picture was taken 22 years ago. Wow. This picture was taken in the Queen's office at Buckingham Palace on the day she conferred on me the highest knighthood in the Royal Victorian Order, GCBO, which is what I have. Um, and um, um, I had, uh, uh, I was very privileged to have had a personal relationship with both the Queen and Prince Philip, the Duke of Edinburgh, her husband. Um, such personal relationship that uh, um, uh, one of my children at a reception in which I presented my son to the Queen, the Queen asked him what he did and MNEK is the name of my son, said that he was a student at Birmingham University. And the Queen uh, said to him, well, I'm coming to Birmingham to university in three weeks' time to join you in celebrating your important anniversary. And my son said, yes, Your Majesty, we're all greatly looking forward to your visit. This was on a Monday, and two days later, the office of the Vice-Chancellor of Birmingham University received a telephone call from Buckingham Palace to say that Her Majesty would like young Anyoku at the lunch. Wow. Wow. And, and um, <laughs> after my retirement as Secretary General, I was greatly honored and humbled when I was asked to come to the palace to see the Queen and I went to see her and she said to me, well, I'd like you to succeed my cousin, the Duke of Gloucester, who came out here for our 50th independence anniversary. I'd like you to succeed him as my trustee on the board of the British Museum. And so I was uh, 
the Queen's trustee on the board of British Museum for eight years. Um, in the same way as again after my retirement, I succeeded Prince Philip as the international president of WWF, Worldwide Fund for Nature. Uh, so my, my um, contacts, I was very privileged to have these personal contacts with the Queen and Prince Philip. Okay, so we zoom in from the Queen to you as a person. What is it about you that the public do not know yet? I mean, they know you as a Secretary General of the Commonwealth, a former Foreign Minister, um, so many other positions that you've had and so many other things you've done. Can you shock us with one thing that the public hasn't heard that we need to document on conversation with history? <laughs> <laughs> I suppose <laughs> what I can say is my eating habits. <laughs> that I love and salad soup mm. and uh, a wedu and amala. Oh my word. And I'm, I, can, I, I can almost guess where the amala, a wedu influence is coming from. Oh yes. And your guess will be right. <laughs> because until I, I married. Okay. Um, yeah, no, no, in fairness, no, no, I, uh, we were served a way do at University College of Baden. Okay. That was the first place where I, I, I ate a way do. Mm -hmm. uh, but after that, uh, my taste matured <laughs> after my marriage, a way do. Okay. And then sala soup and onubu soup because of my mother. My mm. mother was uh, the best cook of masala soup. Can right? you beat that? Who's say. mother soup? <laughs> <laughs> oh my word. So, so what's your guiding uh, philosophy? I mean, what has guided you through life? You have come a long way and you have, uh, you have made a distinctive impact in all that you've done. What is that principle? What is that philosophy? What's that word of wisdom that has guided and guarded your actions? I believe fundamentally in what, uh, I think it was um, uh, Graham who put it this way, that when wealth is lost, nothing is lost. When health is lost, something is lost. But when character is lost, everything is lost. So I believe in my two most essential words are hard work and integrity. Fantastic. So tell me something. I mean, you are almost 90. Yes. In a few months, yes. you'll be 90 years old. I'll be 90 old. in January, yes. You'll be 90 years old. Yes. And I'm looking at <laughs> a young dude who could still uh, talk to some 30-year-old and say, hey girl, how are you? And she will still give you that cursory look and say, it may be, like you said, in the, in the, the parlance of the woman, you know, yes. when she means yes. yes. Uh, what is that secret that keeps you glowing? I'm looking at you now. Your skin is really <laughs> fresh. Your face, everything. You're just looking really handsome <laughs> and yeah. well taken care of. What is that yeah. thing you do that does, you know? You're very kind, very kind to be saying all that, but I believe... I'm not flattering you. That, um, I'm sure others have told you this. Yeah, um, well, the truth is yes. <laughs> 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 okay. uh, but uh, I believe that uh, it's helped me and continues to help me uh, to be mindful of what I eat, not to fail to take exercise, and uh, indulge myself in a glass or two of red wine every day. Every day? Yes. And uh, I walk at least one kilometer every day. Even now? Even now. Give us three names that have inspired you. Great men and women. 
who have inspired you in life? Mm. Well, I would uh, uh, think first of uh, uh, Nigerians, the man who probably inspired me most was my father's good friend Enoch Oli and the principal of the school I went to, the founder and principal. Of it. He was a very strict individual, well educated, Oxford and London universities, and uh, believed in simple life, simple lifestyle. As, as a young student at Madison Supply School, I sought to copy him in uh, many things. And when I was, uh, when I joined the diplomatic service, two people always inspired me wanting to be like them. One was Chief Adebo, Chief Simeon Adebo, who was an ambassador in New York, under whom I worked. And the other was the British Foreign Secretary, who performed brilliantly as Foreign Secretary, but failed woefully as Prime Minister. Anthony Eden, Sir Anthony Eden. Um, I greatly admired his speeches and uh, uh, general conduct, as, as I was aware. Uh, but I said he, he was a brilliant foreign secretary, foreign minister, but a woeful prime minister because he was the prime minister who um, joined in invading Egypt over Suez, and that finished him. Each time we see you out there, there, is, there seems to be an identity when it comes to your fashion taste. What has inspired that? <laughs> <laughs> I, sub, I, I often say to my friends, since I returned to Nigeria in 2000, that if they see me in a jacket, they should know that I'm either on my way to the airport or on my way back from the airport. <laughs> because I made it a rule. In fact, it goes back to this Senate screening committee that said... You don't belong. They said to me, one of the things they said to me, they said, you're going to be foreign minister, but we've never seen you in a Nigerian attire. We always see you in a jacket and tie. So when I returned to this country in 2000, I made up my mind, you will never see me in a tie, a jacket. Um, not to mention Thai, except when I'm going to the airport to travel. Or you're coming back. Or when I'm <laughs> coming back from the airport. And I must say you have kept that resolve. And it, you're doing very well because, I mean, it has become an identity <laughs> with you. There's this question I'd like to ask, and this is uh, leaning on your experience and your encounters and engagement, you know, within the African continent. Now, how do we, as a continent, as a people, the black people in the African continent, how do we put our acts together? Because it will seem there is no unity. Everybody seems to be doing their own thing. I, I want to believe that uh, maybe there's something you could say or there's some solution, you know, in addressing this discord that seems to disunite us as a continent, uh, as a people in Africa. Well, I think, by and large, it's regrettable that we do not have Pan-Africanist leaders on the continent anymore. We no longer have uh, people like Kwame Nkrumah, 
Julius Nyerere, Tafawa Balewa, um, and uh, Jomo Kenyatta, people who believed, and uh, Nelson Mandela, who, people who believed in the African personality and believed in, in Pan-African approach to restoring respect and for dignity of African persons globally. We do not have such leaders at the moment. Nigeria's strength and image would be enhanced when we get our act at home right. This is it. <laughs> and before we go, I would like for you to tell us your dream, your Nigerian dream. Share that Nigerian dream with us again. Remind us of the Nigerian dream, Chief Emeka Ayoko, who holds in his heart. My dream for Nigeria, a country that I love, is to see Nigeria prosperous, to see Nigeria a secure place, and so an attractive tourist destination, to see Nigeria exert its influence, not just in Africa, but globally as representative of the black race. I see Nigeria, my dream is that Nigeria will become true to its destiny of being the representative of the black race across the world. And I say a big amen to that prayer. And so on that note, I want to say thank you so much for uh, having us in your home as we've had this conversation with history. It's been a jolly good ride. I mean, you didn't disappoint me in any way. In fact, I, I, I've come to know one or two things, one or two new things about you. And uh, thank you very much. Well, I thank must you. thank you and, and say that you've been a very, very good interviewer. And uh, you obviously have the capacity of drawing people out. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much thank you i feel so privileged like i said i will laminate this hand i hope the, the photocopy machine will work tonight because i've got to laminate it and tell everybody i just had a handshake with the great chief in Mikayoko. so it's such a pleasure i'm intrigued by your name to start with <laughs> thekla i never had that name before until i I had about I had it from you. Um, it intrigued me, named Thekla, and it's a lovely name, and, uh, and and you carry it well and fittingly too. <laughs> <laughs> my head is falling off my shoulder already. <laughs> thank you so much, sir. <laughs> And so on that note, I want to say thank you so much for being part of a conversation with history. Like I'd always say. Be kind to one another and stay well.